My dad was a dry drunk, and my mom was so passive, and they were both brought up in residential school. They couldn't teach us anything cultural or to be encouraged about anything. That didn't happen. They never even hugged us. They couldn't. They didn't know how. I gave up my kids to child welfare because I felt so inadequate. I felt like I was not doing a good job. And so I thought child welfare would do a better job than me. When I was living in Saskatchewan, I was just a little baby at the time. I was with um, an uncle and his his girlfriend at the time, and um, I lived with them since I was born, and I guess I went through a lot of um, abusive stuff with them. I've only heard stories, but my grandma knew what was going on, so she got my auntie to come get me and um, ended up taking care of me from two years old till, till I was about 12. And um, she passed away around that time, so my aunt was the last house I lived at before I got apprehended and I was put into a de detention center. After I got out of the detention center, YYC, I um, was put into a uh, ward of the government. I AWOLed from every single group home they ever put me in. I didn't care. I thought, oh, it's pretty laid back. I could do whatever I want. That's what I thought. And I just bounced around from group home to group home, no stability. And the social worker got sick of it, and she actually found me a foster home an hour out of Edmonton. I mean, the purpose of colonization is to create a vulnerable group. And I think that it was very successful because it, it left us really vulnerable to um, government whims. So going back then to the treaties and, and uh, the reserves, the establishment of the reserves, we made agreements to, yeah, we will, we will sign over these massive tracts of land in exchange for certain rights and benefits in perpetuity. Right, so forever, and yet we know that those rights have been whittled away. Within three weeks, I started phoning the department to try and get my kids back. And you know what? I couldn't. And um, But when my little baby came home, and he was always smiley baby, eh? always laughing and smiling when he was little. And when he came home, he was just spaced out and and he had, um, he didn't smell very good, he was dirty. And the child welfare worker had uh, medicine on one hand, um, antibiotic I guess, and, and she had the baby in one hand and she said, here, and she gives me the, the medicine. And then I took a scissors, it was shrunken sweater, and she stood there and she said, well, don't do that, you know. <clears throat> and so I got really mad at her. I put the scissors down and I said, you get the fuck out of my house right now. In the mid-60s, I think it was about 1967, and we see the young white social workers starting to move into the reserves. The misconception that they have about uh, Aboriginal people and also not understanding how some Aboriginal people live. And my experience and interest in child welfare go back to when I was a social worker in the 60s when uh, people were being scooped. There were so many stories there that I my colleagues really had very little idea about and actually became saddened, outraged, angry, every emotion you could find, ashamed all these things that came to mind when I realized that what had actually happened. There was an undertone when I look back on it that was essentially racist. The perspectives that had been described by the people who ran residential schools or created residential schools didn't go away. We became, I think, a lot more subtle or careful about how we term things, but I think the underlying feelings or attitudes were still much the same. I kind of lost touch with my family, my brothers and sisters, but when they got taken away from my mom, I don't know, we, we didn't really have a relationship anymore.
I guess in 2005 and six, me and my brother were starting to build a relationship again. He liked rapping, MCing, so I promised him that when he turned 18, I'd take him to all the hip hop shows and b-boy battles and everything. That was like, that was gonna be like our time together. As soon as we, that started happening, he um, ended up in a hospital, mental health section, and then they sent him to Alberta Hospital after that. I guess it's because the group home couldn't handle him or something. They said he had behavioral problems, but that was only because of like whatever my brother was been through, you know? He had a lot of anger inside him. He didn't know how to deal with it. I was actually getting ready to go to Italy to go dance at a festival. And then the next day I got a phone call from Alberta Hospital saying that he ran away. And um, I was just hoping he'd come to my house, but he never showed up and days went by and I st no answer and they still didn't know where he was. So I just assumed he was at a friend's house. And then finally, Saturday, I left to Italy and then five days later, I got a message in the email saying to contact the government. And then um, I called and the social workers of his told me I better sit down and they told me what happened to him, that they found him on the CN railroad tracks um, here in Edmonton. And I was just shocked and I just broke down after that. Um, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> so they paid for a ticket for me to come back to Edmonton for his funeral, um, which is messed up because I always ask them for a driver. Because I know I've been in foster homes, I know that you can get a driver to go visit your family. And they would say, we're not gonna pay for a driver to go for you to visit your brother. <laughs> but they like told me they'd pay for a freaking $2,000 plane ticket for his funeral, you know? It's so messed up. He passed away two weeks before he was turning 18 and I was just like, I was so depressed. I didn't want to go to any more shows and uh, yeah, I, I was going to quit dancing. One weekend I uh, just left my kids with a friend and I kept on drinking and drinking. And I, once in a while, I would think I got to go pick up my kids. But I was going through so much stress from, you know, my marriage wasn't working or anything. And so <clears throat> I decided not to. I'll go and get them Sunday. And when I did, they told me they were in child welfare. The system has, has been structured so that we not only are lacking power, but so that then, then we feel powerless. I felt so intimidated by the court, by child welfare and everything. I felt like, uh, and I started crying when they were talking to me, and when I didn't understand what it was they were trying to say to me, because to me it was like foreign language, you know, the, the, they were asking for, I guess, temporary guardianship. I didn't know nothing about things like that, you know. Mm -hmm. I just stood there, and then in the end, um, they were going to keep my kids. That's all I understood. And then I just walked out of court, and I was crying. And then I just walked into York Hotel and got drunk and stayed drunk for the rest of the month. Every time I sobered up, you know, or waking up from, the first thing that was in my head were my kids and I didn't know where they were. And that is worse, I think, sometimes than if they would have died, because at least you know there's a finality or whatever. But it was like they had died. When we study our history, we begin to understand why it is we have the difficulties we have in our communities, eh? The more I did that, the more I began to understand my life. Mm -hmm. The more I began to understand my mom and dad's life as children, and my grandparents. And the more I understood also, the more I began to realize it wasn't because I was bad. It was because I didn't have an opportunity to be strong like the roots of an oak tree, because my traditions and my values and my spirituality was not there, and it isn't the fault of my mom and dad. 
they didn't have an opportunity. I've been dancing off and on for six years, doing hip hop and breaking, and um, I've been fancy dancing since I was six. Um, hip hop is something I kind of just put myself in, I got into because it doesn't really cost money. Like doing breaking, all I need is this floor and my music, and it's my own creativity and my own my own moves. You know, there's foundation to it, but it doesn't cost money for me to do it because um, I couldn't afford dance lessons and stuff so breaking was it I don't know what I'd be doing right now if I didn't have dancing seriously I don't know what I'd be doing because this is my bread and butter and it's my love and it's taking me to, like around the world and <laughs> And I'm still doing crazy stuff with it, so I'm just happy that I got into it when I did. Jack was slapping me in the face. Okay. Off and on, I heard a little bit about my rights. But it was, most of it was only by chance, like it would slip out from someone's mouth and I'd be like, what? Oh, I have this amount of money to do this? Or, oh, I can do that if someone does something to me or whatever. I, I was never really given a rule book or a law book. It really should be coming from the child welfare workers. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're the ones dealing with them. They should be telling. Uh, it should come from the lawyers. The lawyer should be telling the children what their rights are, their parents what their rights are. When I, as the lawyer, ask the government, okay, well, what duty of care do you owe to the children if you take them in care under a permanent guardianship order? It's a pretty important question, pretty basic question, and you don't get an answer. How do you know? And all these issues are interrelated. I mean, you touched about the whole area, the question about do the women know their rights? I think the short answer is no. <laughs> you know, they don't. They, they are not told their rights. I was just talking to a client just, just 10 minutes ago. And what she told me is uh, they told her that they were going to get a permanent guardianship order and that she had no choice or no options and they were going to take her children away. And she didn't know she could get a lawyer. She didn't know she could fight it in court. The stress that these parents are under in the middle of these processes, of these court cases, they face losing their children. They have, they're so distraught, they're so upset, they're not thinking clearly, and then they don't even get the proper information. And they're, you know, they're told, um, you know, you have no chance of winning. That's, that's what they've told me, that the workers told them, well, you have no chance of winning, you might as well just agree, you know, why fight it out? And then in their despair, they just agree. And that's a good picture of them. Yeah. The first set of grandkids, which is this young girl now, who's a mother now, um, those ended up in care. I was, these other kids, their mother passed away. She had surrendered her kids on Thursday night and on Friday night she passed away. And I came to the funeral and I said, I'm here. I'll take my grandchildren. You know, oh no, we have to go to court, you know, you can't do that. And so <clears throat> we went to court and I, uh, I got denied. They said that um, it would be too hard for me to look after four special needs kids. And I said, special needs? Uh, I said, if you're saying my grandchildren are special needs, I, ne I need diagnostic reports from you. Because I'm diabetic and I have thyroid problem, the next thing was that I, you know, I'm not well enough to look after all these kids. When I got denied uh, to have access to my, you know, to have uh, custody of my grandchildren, I told the child, uh, the child welfare worker, I said, you know what, you know I'm going to appeal this. I am going to appeal it. You're not getting my grandchildren. And I immediately, you have 30 days, and you know most parents, 
don't know that, nobody tells them. I think that most people have no idea what their rights are at all. And in fact, I find it very interesting that I think in a lot of ways, many people in the, in the system don't know what the parents' or the children's rights are, uh, sometimes including the lawyers and the child welfare workers. Sometimes I just feel like grabbing somebody by the scruff of the neck and just, you know, why can't you do what you're supposed to do? It was so hard to try and, you know, get our family back together again. If the leaders all stood up and say, look, you're not taking our goddamn kids anymore. Are they going to keep on? No. I've had experience where the chief in some communities said, you're not coming on this reserve anymore. And we wouldn't. We wouldn't. I did appeal. We were able to go to court, the Court of Queen's Bench. And within a week or so, she had made a decision that the kids would come back to me. They had to return the kids to me immediately, she said. And the kids, they've been with me ever since. For me, where I get, where I get inspiration and where I get hope is, is in the renegades. It's the people that are willing to take leadership and take responsibility, I guess. It's kind of weird. I started working with kids when I was a teenager. I worked in this program um, called Dimensions. That's when I really learned about um, being kind of a healthy person. And so I was actually taught, you know, how to treat kids and take care of them and stuff. It's really cool. But it's interesting because um, that helped me when I started getting into breaking. Uh, I joined the Red Power Squad. So Jack, look and Jack, look and Jack. Look, look, mentor native. youth Jack. through hip-hop and native yeah. culture. So when I joined them, when I started dancing, I actually I already knew how to like take care of kids or like talk to them and it's just really interesting. But this time I could do it through dance and through hip-hop and my own culture. So I've been doing that ever since I started, um, since like 2003. I've just been blessed to travel with Red Power Squad and different organizations and crews. and. Um, just do social work through hip hop. That's basically what it is, social work. And it's, I'm kind of like a social worker now without the certificate. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> I got some right here. But look at my 16 year old granddaughter. You know, she took traditional parenting before she ever got pregnant. She's 17 now. She's a mother already, and she's such a terrific little mother. Oh, look at this. She looks like a little doll. <laughs> <laughs> had she not, if she had been stuck in child welfare, would she have taken responsibility for her baby? I wonder. Educate yourself as much as you can and to know that you have rights. And what I tell my mothers is, Get to know all the different agreements within child welfare because you have rights. You can partake in the involvement with your kids in child welfare and never quit. Because the children are so important. They're the most important thing in the world.